So, the length that it gives you is that the maximum length or the minimum length? <coughs> minimum length, right? Because anything shorter than that, stress transfer is not complete optimum, right? It does not get to the max fiber strength. Of course, you multiply by a factor of safety, okay? <laughs> you don't want the fiber to break. So, maybe 1.1 .1 times that, okay? Something like that. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, you know, typically when you put fibers in, chopped fiber is random orientation, right? So, and to the loading direction, you don't know a priori what the loading direction is going to be. If you do, then you can align them, okay? But if you can't, then some of them will be in the load direction, okay? The ones that are not in the load direction are not going to play much role, okay? But the ones that are close, you know, within five degrees to the load direction. For them, this thing will work very well, okay? To utilize their full uh, efficiency, okay? Effectiveness. Okay, so now we embark on sandwich plate theory, okay? This is very important now, especially now, because of the drones that are being used, okay? A lot of these uh, UAVs, as we call it, UAS, they use this kind of a sandwich panel instead of monolithic composite panels, okay? As opposed to, you know, ones used on, say, Airbus or Boeing at 787, those are monolithic composite, meaning no core, okay? But for the UAVs, so why? Why, why do we need to use this kind of core? Why sandwich? Okay, very good. Because you can get the same effective bending stiffness at, you, your answer was part, okay? The full answer is bending stiffness increases. For, less weight, okay? You have, so specific bending stiffness is much higher, specific. When you divide by the same, you know, area, one, say, one square centimeter area, you are getting much greater bending stiffness. So, applications where bending stiffness, like a wing, for example, is important to you, and it comes directly from the D matrix, okay? H cubed, right? So, if you're core just separates the face sheets, you know, by its, the geometric effect that you're seeing primarily. So, H is much larger, therefore the bending stiffness is much greater, okay? As opposed to having just the face sheets just back to back, okay? Clearly, it will be a lot less stiff in bending, okay? And A is, is unchanged, of course, okay? All right, and symmetric, so B is not a factor here if it's symmetric, okay? So, and it's called sandwich because it has two face sheets and a core, okay? And face sheets are typically bonded to the core, okay? They use strong adhesive bond, okay? And that could potentially be a weak link, okay? And I have to tell you this quick story then, what uh, happened. Uh, how many of you have heard of the NASA X-35? I was involved in not the design, but some of the uh, modeling. What the X-35 was planned for is to replace the, the space shuttle. See, uh, Challenger blew up. Why? Because what happened to Challenger? Nobody knows? Ceramic? No. Come on, somebody. It's not that far back. <laughs> In 1986, the Challenger Space Shuttle blew up because the booster rocket, you know, there was a leak and that flame hit the external fuel tank. Okay, that big red orange thing on the side and that ignited, that has liquid hydrogen and oxygen. So, the whole thing blew up after maybe 
few minutes after launch. Okay. So NASA decided to intern, make the fuel tank internal to the space shuttle, okay. and that was the X-35 design. And clearly, they couldn't make it out of metal because of the weight problem, so they wanted to make it out of composite. Okay. And one of the options they were looking at was sandwich composite, okay. face sheet with the honeycomb core, and inside there would be liquid hydrogen, liquid uh, oxygen, you know, separate tanks. And that will be all internal. So when it flies, you know, it will just fly, look like a plane with no external tank hanging outside, okay. And that would make it safer from the booster, you know, in case there is a misfire. And so, so in the design phase, uh, this was tested, I believe, at NASA by Lockheed Martin company. They always collaborate with some industry when they're building a prototype, okay. So, so they were testing the uh, internal tank, and it was made of honeycomb with face sheet, okay. And it looked, you know, kind of like a oblong shaped, you know, uh, something like this. Uh, pad, please. Notepad. Anyway, it was conformal shaped, okay, and it had. Okay, good. Finally, okay, it is a shape something like that, okay, and and it's all made of three D, okay. <laughs> And so I'm looking at the top, from the top, okay. And the cross section of this uh, tank was face sheet, face sheet, and honeycomb core, okay. So a honeycomb, you know, it's hexagonal, right? Hexagonal honeycomb core, okay. So each cell had this honeycomb shape, right? So what happened was uh, they had filled the tank with liquid. Uh, they didn't use liquid hydrogen, of course. It's extremely dangerous. So they used liquid, I believe, nitrogen or maybe liquid helium, something like that. They filled it, and then they drained it okay, because they wanted to do as many cycles to see what happens, uh, filling and refilling. Okay, so. So let's say this is the inside and that is the outside, okay, inside of tank and this is outside. So, so if they say used liquid nitrogen, it was minus, close to minus 200 Celsius, right. And when they drained it out, of course, so when they filled it, what happened was the honeycomb, there was air, right. There is air in the honeycomb and that air liquefied, okay. The air liquefied and it, so there was liquid, you know, in each of the honeycomb air had become liquid and then when it was cold, you know, there were micro cracks initially that is how the air got in, in into the honeycomb, micro cracks closed because of the contraction, okay. When you cold, cool a composite, it closes the cracks, okay. And then when they uh, evacuated it completely and then they left for home basically for over the overnight and but they had cameras, video cameras looking, you know, uh, security cameras. And then they found what happened was right around say 1 a.m. suddenly it split open, the tank completely split open. And they had no idea what was going on, why it happened. <laughs> you know, there was no fuel inside, nothing. Why did it split open? Anybody knows why? Yeah. Very good. Yeah, the air started to expand, okay, but the micro cracks were still not open enough to allow it to pass. So the pressure started, you know, liquefied air, when it becomes gas, it requires a lot of space. So what it did was it 
pushed and caused delamination and the delamination went all the way to a major junction of the tank. You know, it, it has to be glued together and it just split open. So, it kind of, you know, just like peeling an orange, okay, it kind of peeled open like that. And this is called, the phenomenon is called cryopumping. That is a new word that we <laughs> learned from this problem, cryopumping, because cryogenic temperature pumps in the air and then, yeah, I am sorry, I, I think I said it the other way. When the temperature gets cold, the cracks open up and the air gets in and when the temperature starts to rise, the cracks close up yeah. and the air starts to boil okay? and it cannot escape and that is when the ground. So, temperature cold the cracks actually because of the uh, residual stress is higher as I said the cracks were opening up more air was getting in and freezing and becoming liquid and when it was warming up close no escape explosion. Okay. So, they abandoned this after that the whole project was <laughs> abandoned after this disaster or maybe NASA realized that uh, reusable launch vehicle was not sustainable, which is sad as aerospace because it was a great vehicle, you know, great design, a design that can sustain Mach 17 speeds and land at 200 miles per hour. Okay? That is a achievement from aerodynamic standpoint and structural and control standpoint. It is gliding in, it has no power, unpowered landing from orbit and the computer decides you know how much energy needs to be. So, it does you know a lot of this S curves to, to shed kinetic energy. So, when it lands, it lands at a you know higher than normal airliner, but around 200 you know miles per hour. Anyway, so moving to this then. So, so this type of um, cores have been used for fuel tank and of course, for making wing panels for um, UAVs. Okay? So, it is important and the main driving philosophy is that you get more specific stiffness, bending stiffness. Okay? Uh, so, what we do when we are handling this and by the way, we are going to use similar to CLT, but not CLT. Why can we not use CLT for this? Okay, thick and thickness is constant. The face sheet thickness is uniform. Huh? Why? Why? In what? In the core, in the core, okay? Not not the interlaminar necessarily. Core is made of soft material. Think of a foam, which can shear easily, unlike a monolithic composite, which is thin and also it doesn't shear. You can you can say, you know, you can use your intuition. Whereas a soft core, whether it's honeycomb or foam, especially, will shear. So if you throw out shear deformation, you are throwing out the main issue in the case. Okay? So, so, we must include shear deformable plate theory okay, in this okay? and then later on I will talk a little bit about the zigzag theory. Okay? I would add zone. Okay. So, the assumptions are that okay. Uh, the T f is the thickness of the uh, T f top and T f bottom. Okay. T f top is for the top uh, face sheet, T f bottom is for the bottom face sheet in case you want to make them different. Okay. Typically, you do not uh, and core is foam core, but uh, let us see I can.
we'll see. Uh, I think this is the thickness is H. Okay, thickness of the core is H, and T F, and T uh, T F top and T F bottom are the thickness of the of the face sheet. Yeah. Uh, assumptions: the core sustains only transverse shear stress. Okay, so we are saying clearly here, core can only handle tau x z. Okay or x1, okay, slight change in notation, we are going to x1, x2, x3 instead of x, y and z. Okay. Um, so, x1, x3 plane, so tau x z uh, are not 0, but sigma 1, sigma 2 and tau 1, 2 in the core are negligible, okay. approximately 0. Okay. So, in plane stress, we are assuming core does not handle. So, this is a very nice example of specialized <coughs> components. Okay. The core is there to sustain transverse shear, because we know the phase sheets cannot do that effectively. Okay. Whereas, phase sheets are there to handle in plane loads, sigma 1, sigma 2 and tau 1, 2. So, you can dividing the responsibility. The phase sheet sustains only in plane loads, that is the assumption. Okay. Plane sections remain plane and do not remain normal to mid plane. Okay. So, that is the difference. So, we are tweaking the Kirchhoff hypothesis. Plane sections still remain plane. So, in other words, when it is like I showed before for CLT, this was the before and this is the after, right. Plane section remains plane and normal to the bend, bending uh, mid plane. Okay. Now, plane sections remain plane, but not necessarily normal. Okay. It can rotate at an angle other than 90 degrees to the mid plane. So that is an important difference. That causes shear in the core. Both core and face sheet are orthotropic and elastic and we assume small rotation just like in uh, all right and i just showed there how what the difference it makes okay if you don't have a core and with with core and without core okay there's a huge difference h2 cube comes into the picture this was only tf cube and this is tf plus h over 2 so, h over 2 could be uh, 0.5 inch. Okay? So, that is a huge increase in bending stiffness. Okay, so, now, and this is kind of cl cluttered drawing, but essentially, this is our center line. Okay? This is the cross section, top face sheet, bottom face sheet, h is this and x 1 and x 3, those are the two planes, uh, those are the two coordinates, x 1, x 3 and x 2 is therefore, into the paper, okay? into the paper. Uh, displacement in uh, x 1 direction is u, displacement in uh, y direction is w, in the z, uh, x 3 direction is w and v in the y direction okay? or x 2 direction. So, so what happens after bending? Okay, after bending, it looks something like this. And this is not the greatest diagram, but uh, what I'm trying to show here is that the rotation of okay. Yeah, this is not a very good. Uh, essentially, psi 1 is the rotation of the normal, okay, uh, from the original position of the normal, okay, that is psi 1. And so, and you can show that psi 1 is greater than du 3 dx 1. 
So, there will be shear deformation and we will develop this as we go, but so due to the shear deformation normal does not remain a normal, the angle varies okay of course, depending on the shearing. So, the displacement relations okay, so we do two categories of displacement relation, one for the phase sheet, one for the core. Okay. So, for the phase sheet we have u 1 f equals u 1 naught, okay, u 1 is x direction, right? u 1 naught x 1 x 2 plus h over 2 psi 1 x 1 x 2. Okay. So, this is a little different. Okay. So, psi 1 is like beta okay, in the C L T, right? But we are not putting z there. What? H over two y. Why is that? Remember, this is h. So from the center line, it's h over two. Any idea why? <laughs> Right. So, well, we are saying this, okay, that typically it should be z times psi 1, right, but we are saying that the face sheets are very thin compared with the core, right, much thinner. Core may be 1 inch, face sheet may be 0 0.1, 0 0.01 inch, okay, right. So, this you know, two orders of magnitude difference. So, what we are saying is that uh, z is h over 2 and it is basically this phase sheet is so thin that there is no variation in the stresses through the. So, if you calculate h over 2 times psi that gives you the, the curvature effect in the entire phase sheet. Okay. There is no other because it is so thin there is no further z variation if it is really there, but it is so small you discount it. Okay h over 2, okay, plus minus because top or bottom, okay. So, we have plus minus, plus for top, negative for bottom. Similarly, u 2, this is the v displacement, u 2 naught, which is the mid plane, plus minus h over 2, psi 2, okay. And u 3 of the phase sheet f is u 3 x 1 x 2, which is basically your w term, okay and u 3 phase sheet and core are the same. Okay. We, we you know the whole thing is moving like a rigid body in the w direction, the z direction. Okay. So, that is for the phase sheet. For the core u 1 c, okay. c implies core, f is phase sheet. Okay. So, u 1 c equals u 1 naught that is the mid plane plus now z times x 3 times psi 1. Okay. So, so, for the phase sheet uh, for the core now we are using the z times kappa definition or not in this case z times rotation. Okay. And u 2 will be similar u 2 plus x 3 times psi 2, okay. psi 1 remember beta x and beta y is like that psi 1 and psi 2. Psi 1 is the rotation about the x axis and psi 2 about the y. All right. So, x 3 times psi 2 and these are functions of x 1 and x 2. Okay. So, we have done separation of variable basically, x 3 has been separated and then u 3 c of course, we know is same as u 3 naught is equal to u f u f u 3 f okay they are all the same any question okay so again psi is the rotation of the normal and even though we assume that the normal stays uh, straight it doesn't become that or that and it doesn't stretch but it will rotate more than 90 degrees. Okay. It can do this or that. Okay. 
and that causes the shearing. Okay. Strain displacement relations relationship. Okay. And again, plus h over two means top face, minus h over two means bottom face. Okay. You can argue it should be h over two plus T f over two, but T f over two is so small you ignore it. Uh, so, strain displacement is epsilon 1 f okay, in the phase sheet first. You take, go back to this, right? same pr procedure. The, you, know, you define your displacement based on the kinematics of the problem. Okay? And then, once you have this, then the rest is just what we call turning the crank. Okay? Same pr process. Now, derivative respect to x 1 of that, which gives you u 1 naught derivative respect to x 1 plus minus h over 2 d u d psi 1 d x 1. Epsilon 2 f is d u 2 uh, d x 2 again, which is uh, mid plane and plus minus h over 2 derivative of the rotation right, in respect to x 2. And you can immediately recognize that this term is the, these two terms are the mid plane. They are strains, mid plane strain. And these two terms are curvature, okay. <laughs> it is not second derivative, but that does not second, that curvature does not have to be second derivative, <laughs> because psi is the rotation. The derivative of rotation gives you curvature. Okay. In CLT, it turned out to be rotation was dW dx. So then it became d2 w dx2 okay, curvature. Yes. Oh, yeah. Sure. Oh. Cutting out. How do I get rid of this? Problem, still going off screen a little bit. Okay, can you see better? What? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, no problem. Yeah, I should have told me sooner. <laughs> um, strain displacement. Okay, so. So, where were we? Okay. So, these are the strains for the phase sheet epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and epsilon 3 will be 0 because there is no z dependence in the w in the deflection. So, that is and that is part of our assumption. There is no stretching of the normal. Gamma 1, 2 will be the cross derivative, okay, d u x 2, d u 2 x 1, and this is what you get, okay. This is the mid plane uh, shear strain, and this is the twist curvature, okay, plus or minus h over 2, twisting curvature. And gamma 2, 3, and gamma 1, 3 are going to be 0, you can show that easily, because they do not carry any shear. The phase sheet carries only in plane load, epsilon 1, epsilon 2 and gamma 1, 2 in plane strains and therefore in plane stresses. Now, the core strain displacement relations immediately we can say that epsilon 2, 1, 2 and 3 and gamma 1, 2 are 0, that is part of our assumption. There is no in plane strains in the phase sheet in the, in the core. Okay. However, we have epsilon 4 which is gamma 2, 3. Okay, is du2 dx3 plus du3 dx2. So, du3 dx2 is not 0 plus in this case psi2. Why? Because uh, u2 for the core, if you recall, had x3. So, if you take derivative of this respect to 
x3 this term goes away and all is left is psi 2. Okay. All right. So, du3 dx2 plus psi 2. Similarly, gamma 3 1 which is epsilon 5 du3 dx1 du1 c dx3 mid plane strain with respect to x1 plus psi 1. Okay. So, these are the shear strains okay. and you can see right away now that for, uh, for our previous CLT theory, what, what did we see? We saw that shear strain was this term was an, this term was uh, negative u d u 3 d x 2 and shear strain went to 0, but, but here d u 3 d x 2 do not cancel out psi 2 anymore. Okay, it is independent and therefore, you have non-zero shear strain in the 2, 3 as well as in the 1, 3. Okay. So, shear okay, in 1, 3 plane and 2, 3 plane. Okay. All right. So, that is why it is called the shear deformable plate theory. Okay. C p C S P T, C D P T. This is the only rotation, and it also related to the mid-plane strains. Okay. So now, if we combine all this, you know, so we can make it a little less clumsy. Combining, we have epsilon one, two, epsilon six. This for the fire uh, for the phase sheet, and the core. Okay epsilon 4, epsilon 5. So, we have the mid plane terms, all of them have mid plane terms, okay. not implies mid plane, plus minus h over 2, kappa 1, kappa 2, kappa 6, 0 and 0. Okay. So, it is tempting to put these in there, but they are not curvatures, they are rotations and therefore, affiliated with shear strain, not curvature. Okay. So, they are contained in the epsilon 4, epsilon 5 definition, the psi 1 and psi 2. And these are derivatives of psi 1, psi 2 and so forth. And hence, they are curvatures, okay. these terms, okay. h over two, h, h 2 times d psi 1, h 2 times d psi 2 and so on. And there is a plus or minus there, okay. plus for the top and minus for the bottom phase sheet. And this is the full definition of the mid-plane strains. Okay. No, notice that the rotation terms are in here for the epsilon 4 and epsilon 5 and kappas are defined plus or minus, sorry, each plus or minus is on the ahead of this. Uh, d psi 1 d x, d psi 2 d x and this is the cross derivative. Okay. Okay. Any questions? So, if psi 1 and psi 2 are 0, then and you know you or, or set them equal to uh, dw dx, then we get back our CLT. Okay. But here psi 1 and psi 2 are independent, you know, so we have added extra degrees of freedom to the problem and hence we are allowing shearing to take place. And from this, you can go to higher order theories. Instead of just z times psi, you can have z squared times gamma and so on. Okay? So, other terms in this shear deformation can be added to it. So, that is called the higher order theories. Okay? But here, we will stick with just the uh, first term in that expansion. Stress strain relations, okay? phase sheet sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 6, q 1 1. Okay. You can put q 1 1 bar if you like, because it is really looking at a phase sheet can have many different layers in it. Okay. So, but just to keep things simple, we will put q 1 1, q 1 2, q 1 6. It is fully, could be fully anisotropic. If you have plus minus, you know 0 plus minus 45, 90 so on. Q 1 6, Q 2 6 will no longer be 0, because it is no longer orthotropic. Okay. 
to find q1 ij f okay so so this defines it now okay so i have given a you know how how do we find q ij uh, for the phase sheet you know for the entire phase sheet well you go to gate aij for the phase sheet again if you have n layers sum over them sigma averages nx over 1 over tf right you know thickness averaged so and uh, so what is nx nx is a times epsilon x not right right so and q averages q average times epsilon x not is nx divided by tf and nx is a times epsilon x not right no coupling okay and then from that you can calculate that q average is 1 over tf a that's your average stiffness okay for the uh, for the phase sheet okay so that will be now per unit area and not per unit length a is per unit length this will be per unit area All right, so with that, we go to the core. So it just shows you a way to calculate your Q average. For the core, we assume this relationship, sigma 4, sigma 5, which is tau 2, 3, and tau 1, 3, okay, is G2, 3, and G1, 3 times epsilon 4, and epsilon 5, okay, each multiplying. So, it is a simple diagonal matrix. Of course, you need to know the shear modulus for the core and we are assuming anisotropic properties, orthotropic properties for the core, okay, which can be possible if it is a honeycomb core for example, foam not so much. Okay, you can skip that part. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's a good question. If you have a truss core, uh, but it can still take shear because of the angled stress, right? So, so you have to, from your truss structure, you have to calculate the effective shear stiffness. Okay. It may have coupling. I'm not sure. Yeah, it might. But that's fine too. You can have fully populated shear matrix. But yeah, you have to do some analysis to get the effective shear. You know, apply shear load this way, that way, and calculate the effective shear moduli for a truss structure. Yeah. Good question. Force and moment. Okay. So now we go to force and moment resultant. So, the force resultants are uh, N1, N2, and N6 for the phase sheet, okay. Uh, and so, N1, N2, N6 is integral. So, Tf minus Tf bottom plus H over 2, 2 minus H over 2, right. So, phase sheet is here, the bottom coordinate is minus H over 2 minus T f bottom, right, thickness of the bottom. So, that is what we have here with a negative sign, 2 minus h over 2, which is the beginning of the core. So, we are going bottom up, okay. So, it is sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 6 d x 3, okay. And then we also add the top, which is plus h over 2 to plus h over 2 plus t f top, okay. Sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 6, d x 3. Everybody follow that? I mean, it is just integrating this. So, you start here, go there, and then you start here and go all the way up to the top, because we are only looking at the phase sheet here.
that is n1, n2, n6. Okay. So now, substituting, we are doing now very exactly similar to what we had done for CLT. Okay. So now we substitute for sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 6, and which is Q average, which we have, we know how to calculate from A times epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 6, okay, mid plane strain minus the curvature, okay, terms. The difference is that we do not have Z here, it's minus H over 2, okay. So that makes life actually easier for us. Okay, so this is the uh, for the bottom and this is for the top phase sheet. So, what, what happens when we integrate the first term? We get, this is a constant, right? So, you get x3 from top, okay, minus h over 2 plus Tf, minus h over 2, minus, minus becomes plus Tf bottom plus h over 2, so h over 2 cancels out, only t of bottom is left. And similarly for q bar, a q average for the top, okay. Again, h will cancel out and you are left with t of top, okay. Everybody follows that? So, that gives you your A matrix. So, you get A top, A i j top, q i j t of top, A i j bottom, q i j t of bottom total AIG will be AIG top, AIG bottom, okay, summation, okay, straightforward. Now, B, okay, B matrix is, you can show that it will come out to be, you can probably guess, <laughs> can you guess by looking at this, sorry, not this, but this. What is going to be B? Who is good at <laughs> math? <laughs> yeah, so what is that H? So there is no there is no Z square term, right? It's just same as mid plane strain times. He was there also in the mid plane strain. The only difference will be Q is there for both terms. So what is what is new for for the second term? Somebody say say it loud. H by two, yes. <laughs> so H by two AIJ. Okay, that is your B term. That's exactly what it is. B top is H by two AIJ top. B bottom is minus H by two AIJ bottom, right? Plus minus. So boom. So life is easier because Z dependence is not there for the curvature term. It's just H by two. So total B is H over 2 A i j top minus A i j bottom, okay. Everybody follow? All right. So, we can write N 1, N 2, N 6 is A mid plane strain plus B mid plane curvatures, right. And the definitions are a little different for the mid plane, uh, for the A and B. It is not one half, you know, Z squared and all that stuff. These are the definitions. So, if you know A i j, you can easily calculate B by just multiplying by H over 2. Now, we come to the moment resultant, okay, M 1, M 2, M 6. What we get is that sigma again, now we multiply by X 3 top and bottom, bottom and top, pardon me, H minus H 2, H minus H over 2, H over 2, 2 H 2 plus T of top. But now we have the x3 term in there. Okay, so what happens? Now, this term uh, gets a little 
clumsy, but still doable. So, the first term we get is q times 1 half minus h over 2 squared h, f, h over 2 plus t f bottom squared. Okay. Everybody follow that? Minus minus, you know, minus squared becomes plus. And then this is the bottom term, and this is the top term will be 1 half q similar, except you are using the top coordinates. Okay. H f plus T f top minus H f H over 2 squared. Okay. And so this now is the so called C matrix. Okay. It is not B because clearly it is not the same as B, but this so so now we get A, B, C and D. Is not going to be A B B D, but A B C D. Okay, and that's that's a definition of your C I J. Okay, bottom and C I J top. Okay, and this is the way you can write it. Final form, Q I J H F top C I J will bottom is this, and this is the C I J top, and just like we did for b to get b from a we can get d from c because the only difference again is is the h over 2 term okay so boom so we get dij total will be h over 2 bending stiffness cij top minus cij bottom okay times h over 2 because there is no z dependence for the curvature term and you know it's just h over 2 Clear? No? Crystal clear? Okay. So now, so we defined our ABBD matrix for the phase sheet. What about the what about the core? No? We got the core right here. Okay. Core does not come into the picture for the in plane stresses and moments, in plane forces and moments. Core does not carry any in plane forces and moments. So, the core's contribution comes only for the shear deformation yes. through that. Uh, one second. There we go. Through this, okay, sigma 4, sigma 5 is and so on 4. So, for a sandwich plate, therefore, the total uh, overall in plane uh, relationship is in plane force resultant and moment are related to A, B, C, D, epsilon naught, time, and kappa, right? Where B and C are not equal. Now, we can look at a special case if top and bottom phase sheets are identical. So, up to now, we did not assume they are the same. You can have 0, 90 plus minus 45 on top and minus 45, 90 plus minus 60 at the bottom if you want. But now we are saying they are identical, okay? thickness as well as the orientation. Then, uh, then what happens is T f top is T f bottom and Q i g is the same. Therefore, A i j top equal A i j bottom. What happens then? A i j becomes 2 A i j top overall AIJ, but also we know that BIJ is AIJ top minus AIJ bottom. So, if they are identical, BIJ becomes 0. Sorry. CIJ similarly, what happens to CIJ? CIJ top becomes equal to CIJ bottom, okay? if everything is the same, you can see that here. Okay? this two become identical. One is the opposite of negative of the other. So, C i j total is 0 and D i j becomes 2 times h over 2 C i j, which is h times C i j top. Okay? So, now we have decoupled it, the problem, just like we did with B symmetric. Okay? Again, so if you have a symmetric 
sandwich panel, then it becomes decoupled and we have the extension and the bending completely decoupled. And each one we know how to calculate AIJ and CIJ, so we can solve the problem. Anti-symmetric material stiffness matrix. Yes, yes. No, no. CLT. Yeah. First, classical lamination theory. We get A, B, B, D, and Bs are the same, right? That's your question. But in this case, it's not. Yeah, yeah, but this is not a material, it's a structural matrix, right? It's not a material, of course, material Q matrix is still symmetric, okay? But the, our assumptions result in that B and C are not the same, okay? But it doesn't create any, any you know, physical violation, no. The only thing it'll do is that the effect of curvature, the coupling effect, curvature on, mit, on, on the, uh, on the stretching uh, and the effect of strain on bending are going to be different from each other, okay? That's all. So it's not, it's not a major. I mean, the effect's still there, but it will not be, if the Bs were the same, then they're equal, you know, effect. So the coupling can be weaker or stronger depending on B and C, okay? Oh, symmetry of Q matrix comes from the fact that uh, your material cannot have a moment, okay, like the stress tensor has to be symmetric, right? And so, if stress is related to strain through a matrix like Q, then the Q has to be symmetric to give a symmetric stress tensor. If stress is not symmetric, tau 1 to tau 2, 1 are different, then you will get a moment of a, on a little element, okay, and that's in, inadmissible. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Forgot to give me the time signal today. So, what did we learn from from this session? To summarize, why? Core as shear deformation, okay? Core allows for shear deformation, and therefore we must. Uh, be able to accommodate that, and that affects the phase sheets because shearing will cause change in the curvature of the phase sheet, right? As we saw, the, the, sec, the derivative of psi comes into play in the curvature term, okay? So they are interconnected. You can tell core is shearing, so what, what does it affect? How does it affect the phase sheet? Well, it does through the definition of your curvature. So the kappas are interrelated to the phase sheet. Okay, these are the curvatures. So, so phase sheet deformation affects the, I mean the core deformation affects the phase sheet curvatures, okay. Now, and we kind of specialize that phase sheet carries only in plane loading and core carries only transverse shear, okay, transverse shear loading. Well, so that is a good question. When we say it cannot carry, you know, that sounds like, you know, we are dictating what the core does. Core will do what it wants to do. 
the point here is that compared with what the face sheet is carrying, the core is carrying much smaller loads in plane. Okay, so that's and so we say we ignore it. You know, it's an engineering approximate. Yeah, if it is 0.1 percent of the face sheet load, then it might as well be zero. Okay, so yeah, it does carry some tau one. It will probably carry some sigma one, sigma two as well, but it's typically very very small. Okay, and you don't want it to carry too much of that load because then it may crack. Core foam core can crack easily in plane. But it's good at taking shearing. Yeah. You know, forms can be fairly brittle. Okay, and then the other thing is that uh, we assume that, of course, there is perfect bonding between the core and the face sheet. Okay which is not always the case. Okay, as I showed <laughs> here, there was a weakness and it cracked the whole thing open, the tank. But that is an inside assumption, so you should write that down. Perfect bonding between face sheet and core. And so, and we'll, we'll look at a, we'll look at a, a special problem, special case of cylindrical bending and then we can see how we can solve a problem for a sandwich panel okay, under bending load. So, we will do that in the next session. So, I guess we will take a break now and, uh, and then unless there are other questions.